Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 15. And, you know, two weeks ago, we talked about the idea, actually, at this point, three weeks ago, we were in Exodus. Aye, aye, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, we had the Home Down Heroes, and then we had George Hicks from Interchurch Ministry last week. And, and actually, someone came up to me and says, well, you know, because Interchurch Ministry uh, is, helps fill in pulpits and all that. So someone came up and said, are you leaving? I was like, no, I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me for a while here. So, but, you know, three weeks ago we were talking about how, uh, you know, this came through the Red Sea. And God has been breaking, really, the, the, the ties between Israel and Egypt and the world, if you will. And the first part of the series started off with the idea of heading home. And that, you know, at some point, as Christians, we need to realize this world's not our home. We're just a passing through, as the old song says. Right? And we've gotten so entangled, I think, sometimes in this world, and we, we do what the world does, we act like the world acts, that there's no really no difference, and we've kind of just settled in. But I believe in, you know, just the, the events of the last few years, I think it's really, I say, stirred up the church. And it makes some people a little uncomfortable because the way the world is going is a way we can't go down. There are things that we can't agree to. Right? There's some areas of really not compromise. And I think there's been friction now between those who are believers in Christ and those who believe that God's word is God's word and we're going to hold to it and stand on it. And what the world is saying is okay and acceptable. And I, I'll tell you, just my heart has become more and more of, of Lord come, waiting for the Lord to return. I'm looking forward to heaven more and more every day. And I look at these things, and it serves within us. Well, Israel had, had broken away. They ran away. Uh, Pharaoh had chased them into the Red Sea. God parted. They got to the other side. The sea crashed down. What a great victory. And we left things with Israel just praising, right? We had that song, that sort of musical, if you will, and the, that outburst of, of praise to God. And we sort of had those mountaintop experiences. And I'm sure many of you have had those moments where you just saw the hand of God work in a wonderful way. Maybe it was an answer to prayer. Maybe there was something that you thought was hopeless. There was no way, but you know what? I'm going to pray, and God worked it out. You ever had those? Where you see God's provision, where you saw the hand of God. And we get those moments. It's like, woohoo! But you know what happens to those moments? They don't last. You know, our emotions are a wonderful gift of God. I, I, I like my emotions, but I can't live by them. I can't trust them. I can't trust my feelings because they lie to me. And I look to the Word for truth and for direction. But emotions go up, right? Woohoo! I want to be like this forever. God, I love you. There's nothing we can't do together. God, I will forever just stand by your side. I'm going to read my Bible every day. I'm going to be a man of prayer. I'm going to be all these things. And then Monday comes. And the car breaks down. And the kids are screaming. Right? The bills come in. <sighs> right? <sighs> God hasn't changed. It's just my emotions are all over the place. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Right? I think if you're honest, I think you kind of... We see this in the wilderness. They're, they're praising God, and, and God says, okay, it's time to move on. It's time to move on. We can't stay at these moments forever. Things happen. Life happens. And God's still working on us. And the series I want to go into from here is really the lessons in the desert. That God's working on us, and he's teaching us things that we can't learn always on the mountaintops. And sometimes we have to go through the desert, through the tough times, through the difficult times. And part of it, I think God says, you know what? Do you really love me? Do you really follow me? Oh, yes, God, I will follow you no matter what until 
something happens and the difficulty and the struggle comes. And that's really when we find out if our faith is real. You know, it's easy to praise God when we're all doing it. It's easy to stand behind the pulpit because you guys are expecting me to preach the word, to, to share it, and this is God's truth. And then, you know, then I got to get down and now I got to live it. And the first thing we come across, I think, is a, an area that we often struggle with is the idea of bitterness in our lives. Bitterness, resentment that builds in. The other day, my wife was going through her computer and, and going through all these pictures. And my daughter loves to look at the old pictures. And, oh, and, and she was like, oh, there's a picture of me when I was a baby. Oh, I was so cute. I said, yeah, you, were, you used to be so adorable. She's like, hey, wait, I'm still adorable. And I'm biased because I'm her dad. And oh, yeah, right? I've shared before, you know, she'll see a picture and says, oh, I don't remember this. Well, I said, that was before you were around. And, and most kids hate to hear that you had a life before, you know. So I always tell my daughter, I said, yeah, we well, had a life before you were around. She's like, I don't like that. I said, it was a good life, too. I don't like that. Because she thinks the world started when she came into this world. And she was looking and reminiscing over all these old photos and and she goes, oh, Dad, you're, you know, you're always smiling and all these. And she goes, you know, some of the later ones, she goes, Dad, you don't look so happy anymore. Right? She goes, you know, what's happened? And I'm like, I don't know. I think over the years, life has kind of happened. And it's easy to get cynical, right? Has anyone kind of found your way to that? You know, I remember when I was young and dreamt, and you know, I was a dreamer, and you know, spontaneous. My wife would tell you, yeah, I used to be so spontaneous, and now I'm just stuck in my routine. Now I've been, I don't know, I want to say kind of abused over the years, right? Every people kind of use you, and, and you, maybe your idealism is kind of turned into being a little more, I say cautious, but maybe it reaches over into a little skeptical, you know? You ever find yourself waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? You know what I'm talking about? And it's so easy. And as Christians, we should have the joy of the Lord. We, we have reason to rejoice and, and praise Him. But bitterness is one of those things that can so easily creep into our lives. And it doesn't take long. In Exodus, you know, they, they crossed the Red Sea. They saw the victory, and they're like, wow, God defeated the, the Egyptians. God took care of us in a miraculous way. The, the sea parted, you know. We walked through, and, and the water was up there, and, and the wind was blowing, and we got over, and woo wow, what a moment that was. And now God tells them to move on. And there's a couple of lessons I want to talk about the idea of in the wilderness, but dealing with the idea of bitterness. The first one is we need to follow the leader. Follow the leader. Who, who do we follow? Because in Christian life, we're not made to just sort of sit. I had a pastor who always say, well, you know, Christians struggle with sitting on their blessed assurance. You know, I, they didn't hear, uh, these moments in time that we have, Move on. We, we often look back and say, you know, you talk to churches and, and you talk about, oh, well, God worked. And, and when Pastor so-and-so was here, great things were happening. We look back and we rejoice over these past moments. And the question is, what's God doing now? Right? It's easy to look back and say, well, the church was filled when, you know, say, Pastor Rose. And things were happening when he was here and all this. But what's God doing now? We can't live in the past. Time moves on. We got to follow the leader. Follow the Lord. He should be our leader in all this. And he leads us in different ways. And sometimes we don't want to move. I don't want things to change. Right? But guess what? They do. They do. 
And my wife and I have been married 31 years. I'm looking at her. She's close enough, right? All right. You know? And over the years, we're not the same people we were. You know, I was 20 or 18. We were starry eyed. Fast forward 30 some years now, we are different. Things have happened, life has happened. The idea here is to press forward and follow the Lord. And in this case, we're going to Exodus 15, verse 22 and 23. It says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore they called the name Marah. Marah means bitter. You know? So in here we start off with Moses brought... Depends on what Bible translation you have. Some of it has the idea that, God, that Moses led them. Uh, he caused them to leave. So here they were. Picture this. They've crossed the Red Sea. They've had this great victory. They're celebrating, praising God. And Moses says, it's time to go. And Israel's like, no, we don't want to. This, God did something great here. And Moses says, it's time to go. And they pack up and they head off and they go three days into the wilderness without any water. And finally they come to a place. Now, have you ever done any traveling? And I always, I always picture my family. We went from Minnesota to Maine a few times and as a you know, family of seven of us packed into a, a station wagon. And that was back in the day where the, you know, we used to put a, a mattress in the back of the station wagon and sleep in the back of the station wagon. And that was the best thing as, as a kid. You know, nowadays you get arrested for that. But we used to, you know, go and go on the interstate and slide all back in the back of the station wagon and, you know, hit a bump, go faster. And, you know, my, my stepfather would get frantic. He'd go down and slam on the brakes and we'd all go slide up. Right? Travel like you don't. Now, now they're all bubble wrapped and snapped in. I mean, where's the adventure in that? But, Right? How many of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? You know? Sidetrack here. Uh, a couple years ago, we took a mission trip down to Ecuador, and they have no rules down there. Every day we rode in the back of the pickup truck on the freeway. It was great. You know, the wind blowing, the bugs, you're hanging out for dear life. Woo, you're alive. Anyways. You know, so they, they start heading out into the wilderness, and there's no water. You know, I just picture, you know, my daughter, and I'm thirsty. And you guys said, you know, I like to get in the car and go. So I don't want to give them water because, you know what, you give them water, what's going to happen? Five minutes, I go to the bathroom. You know, so it's like, pfft. here, you know, have some salt. Lick, you know, <laughs> luckily the wife's there to, you know, come on, John, you know. But anyways, so they're heading out, they go three days. And they're thirsty. And finally they come around the horizon and they come to Mara and they come to this great body of water. They're like, oh, water. And the first person comes running up, scoops it up. The water is bitter. We can't drink this. Right? We, we can't handle this. Can I tell you something? When we start following the Lord, the Lord doesn't always take us from blessing to blessing. He always takes us from hilltop to mountaintop and things always get better. I know, I know there's a thought within Christianity that if you give your life to the Lord, everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be wonderful. That is not the case. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. As we follow Him, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And as he does this, he starts laying out things in our lives. And some of them are wonderful. Some of them are difficult. But the Lord still leads us. He still leads us. Just as he led Israel into the wilderness, he led them through a difficult part. He led them three days without water. He brought them to the water. Oh, finally, here's some water, and the water wasn't good. Oh, well, God, wait, what are you doing? Because sometimes the Lord leads us to bitter waters. Sometimes what we're going through, I don't like. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've 
things have been going on, and I've cried out to God, stop it. Right? Stop the world, I want to get off. Have you ever had that? Right? I didn't sign up for this ride. God's like, are you following me? Yeah. But I thought, you know, if I signed up for this, everything was going to be wonderful. God said, I never promised you that. Right? And somehow we think that we kind of God's blessing along with, with following him, that we sometimes get this idea that life is going to be all sunshine and rainbows. And some of you have been around the block a few times. There's been hard spots. Some of you, I, I even think, you know, I'll look at this congregation, some of you this past year has been just murder. But you've been following the Lord. You've been keeping your eyes on Him. You've been doing, right? So it's not a matter you're wrong. It's not a matter you're, you're not following Him. It's just where He's leading you. Life is not all about sunshine and rainbows. But He leads us and directs us. And sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's difficult. The 23rd Psalm, of Psalm many of you guys know. And the one verse in here, verse 4, just shows us how difficult life can be in following Him. You guys know the whole thing, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me. He guides me. And yet in the middle of this, he turns around in verse 4, he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And sometimes the road that he leads us in is a bitter road. It's a difficult road. Sometimes it's through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes it's a point of stress. It's the point of breaking. Sometimes it's the load that's so heavy to bear. The struggle. And he says, I will follow you. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, the key to the Christian life isn't being exempt from the struggle, but that he is there in the midst of it all. Oftentimes my cry is, Lord, stop the storm. And when oftentimes what I find God sees us through the storm. And so in here, I really brings us down to a point of, as we following him, it uh, really comes down to this idea of, 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 in this test, in this situation I'm in, am, am I going to pass this test or am I going to fail this test? It all depends on how we deal with the cir- circumstances that we're in. That's really what it comes down to. Once again, it's, it's easy to praise God when things are going well. I remember we were in Bible school, and there's this one family, and they'd go to the mailbox at school, and, and their, their church supported them, and they'd go to the church, and they would find a check for like $500, right? And they'd be like, woohoo, praise God, I got a check for $500. It's like, oh, wow, great. You know, another month or so would go by, and some couple in the church would send them, you know, they'd say, oh, we got $1,000, woohoo. Well, I, I'll tell you, I was excited. I ran to the mailbox. Open it up. I got a bill. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> now, where, where's, where's my money? Right? And so, it's interesting. We're getting testimony, and this couple was like, oh, you know, the, our, our home church sent us a box of, you know, food. They sent us a box of clothes. Oh, they're, and so, testimony time, they're like, woo, praise God. God is so good. And they'd be like, oh, how are you doing? I got a bill. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh. But God was faithful. God provided. Right? And we see his faithfulness in the everyday, in the midst of it all. We joked around in the Bible school, we lived off oatmeal. And we'd be all excited because sometimes we scrounge together enough money, we'd have oatmeal, we'd have raisins in it. And if you squint, you could almost pretend it was meat. 
right? We're like, oh, yeah. But we look back on those times and God provided in so many different ways in the midst of the storm, right? And it's so easy to get distracted by all the bells and whistles. All we're held accountable is how we react to the situations that we're on. Sometimes we can't control it. And maybe what you're going through now, instead of being bitter and letting bitterness rule in your life, the question is how do you react to that? Is whether or not you fail or you pass the test. Right? God brought them down to the, to the waters. Right? They've been three days without it. I don't blame them for being thirsty. Right? And so they go running down the waters. They taste it. And it's undrinkable. So what's their reaction? What are they going to do? Are they going to follow the Lord and, and trust in Him? We see this pattern with Israel that when things are going well, they're excited and praising God. But when things are going tough, they murmur and complain. And I don't want that in my life. All right? I don't be one of these people that, God, I will praise you when things are going well, but I abandoned you when things get tough. I don't want that. Exodus chapter 15, 24 and 25, it says, And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed them a tree, and then he cast it into the waters, and the waters were made sweet. Israel complained. Just a few days ago, right? Three days ago, God had delivered them from the Egyptians. Just three years ago, they were praising God, right? They had this whole song that they were singing, right? They were in this giant worship service just three days ago, and now, oh God, where are you? You don't care for me anymore. Right? You ever deal with kids? Right? You know, just... A couple, uh, couple weeks ago, we're at Good News Club, and there's this little kid that wasn't being on his best behavior. So I said, okay, you're sitting here. He said, you got to sit next to me. So he sat next to me, and he looked at me and goes, you don't like me anymore. Right? I'm like, how immature? I mean, granted, he's like seven. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know, Right? But I couldn't help but think, boys, am I that way with God? Right? When God's blessing me, I'll tell you, everyone loves Miss Nancy because she, well, not just because, she's wonderful, but she gives them snacks. Right? Kids love it when you give them snacks. You give a chocolate chip cookie to a kid, man, I love you. You tell a kid to sit next to you, I don't like you, right? <laughs> it's like, well, where did that all made with the Lord? Right? When God, you're blessing me, things are going well, God, oh, I will serve you forever. But boys, when things get a little tough, God, you don't like me anymore. Where are you, God? Right? Why have you forsaken me? God's like, I've never forsaken you. And they complained, and God's going to take care. Right? As you follow him, God will take care of you. I will never leave you nor forsake you, the Scripture says. God will, if you are doing what God wants, God will provide for you. He'll take care somehow, some way, along the way. And God did hear. He brought Moses and says, look, take this tree and throw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now I can make it a whole uh, tie-in with the wood, the tree, and the cross, how Jesus comes into our lives and made everything. Uh, I'm not going to do that this morning. But the point I want to bring in is God will provide. If we follow him, God will take care of us. It may be difficult. The struggle may be real. But along the way, God will provide. He has not brought us this far to abandon us. God didn't bring the Israelites out through all this, deliver them from the Egyptians, bring them into the desert to kill them. No. He's going to bring them to the promised land. He's going to see them through if they are faithful in following him. But we don't like struggles, but we need them in our lives. Romans chapter 5 says this, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. 
I remember growing up, it talks about tribulations brings forth patience. Patience means endurance. I remember at one point, you know, I, I was in church, and I was just a young, youngin, and, uh, and a lady said, just pray. She had a bunch of kids. She goes, just, just pray that God will give me patience. And three or four people would kind of pounced on her and said, don't pray for patience. Don't pray for patience. Because you know what? Tribulation brings patience. You don't want trouble, so don't pray for patience. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. That, that seems out of whack. But tribulations brings endurance. That, that's that patience to endure through. Right? It's through the hard times that we see God's faithfulness. Right? It's through the hard times when our, our relationship with him deepens, where I rely on him more. At the end of the day, I, we can get to the end of it and look back and say, God, I don't know how you did it, but you got me through it. And it's a much more meaningful relationship. Right? Think of the other relationships you have in your life. Right? At, at the end of the day, you know, you just shared you married 30 years and we promised each other through better or for worse. My wife tells me, she goes, you owe me a few more better than it's not exactly equal. Right? But we've had some great times. We've gone through a lot. And some of you in your lives have gone through so much. And I've told her, I said, at the end of the day, I can't imagine going through this with anyone else. It's the struggles. That when you make it through the other side, those are the things that bond. Those are the things that make it real. Right? You know, talk about Good News Club, dealing with these kids. You know, I told this kid, no, I, I like you. I don't like what you did, but I like you. You know, just a couple weeks ago, we, I got kicked and pushed and everything else by, by a kid. And he came back the next week. And I gave him a hug and said, hey, I'm so glad to have you. And what, a, what an impact it had on his life. And he actually won the good good boy seat, right? Because he needs to realize, look, I love him in the good times, I love him in the bad times, right? I care for him one way. Now, I don't always like what he does, but it doesn't change how I feel towards him. And the world is so fickle, right? If you just do what the world says, then we'll like you. If you agree with us, then we'll, we'll see you and be your buddy. But boys, if you don't agree, if you don't walk right in line, then wow, we'll cut you right off. Guess what? That's not love. That's not it. God loves us no matter what. He may not like what we do, but he sees us through the struggle, in the midst of the storm, through all these things, through that bitterness, our relationship with him increases and grows, and I become a better person. I become a better Christian through the struggle as we persevere and we get out on the other side. Second Corinthians puts it this way. It says, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. Does that feel like your life? Do you feel like everything's crushing in on you? But see, here's the secret as Christians we have. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. That the joy we have in the Lord, the love we have of him indwelling us is greater than the pressure on the outside. It equalizes as God is in us, filling out, and the world presses in, we can endure because of him. We don't have to cave. We don't have to give up. We can pass the test. Romans chapter 8 says it this way. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword... As is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We were accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. No circumstances, no creature, no wet problem, whatever. God will love you forever. He has said so. Boys, doesn't that just 
bless your socks off. Right? I don't know what that means, but, right? I mean, listen, in the midst of what we're going through, the darkness and the struggle, they are real. I don't want to take away from those things. I don't want to take away from the hurt that you're feeling. But I want you to know in the midst of it all, he is there with you, loving you every step of the way. And through this, we can follow him, and you'll see us through. That in you, through the bitterness, we can have the sweetness of the Lord. Real quick, the text goes on, because we see that sort of the, the answer to this bitterness comes in. The scripture lays out pretty clearly, and I put this, this for that. I'm really bad at alliteration. So, you know, um, I did follow, and, and, you know, and so I came up with F for four. I'm, like I said, I'm real bad at these sermon things like this, but this for that. Because there are times in our lives, we're going to see here, ex- Exodus. It says, then he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them and said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought upon the Egyptians. God says, look, if you follow me, if you will heed my voice, if you will follow my commands, then I will bless you. And I think sometimes we're so cautious, or I, I know as a pastor, because I want to turn around and offer you, say, look, salvation is free. In you, we don't have to earn our salvation. It's, Christ did it all on the cross. He paid for all my sins. He accomplished it all. I can't add anything to it. But in my life, if I want God's blessing, if I want to get through the bitterness in these things, listen, I need to be obedient to him. I can't live like the devil and then expect to be blessed by God. Does that make sense? That he has given us his word. There's an old pastor. I, 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 his name was Charlie Shute. And one of my first churches I was at, and he was passing through, and he asked if he could share from the pulpit. And he got up there. The first thing he said, he held up the Bible. He goes, you guys don't need more of this. And I was horrified as a young pastor. I sat there. It's like, what do you mean you don't need more of this? I like, always need more. He goes, you don't need more of this. He goes, you just need to start doing what you already know. I'm like, you know, that's pretty profound. He says, God's not going to hold you accountable for what you don't know, but he is going to hold you accountable for what you do know. Are you doing what you already know God wants you to do? Are you living his word already? James says it this way, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does it not to him of his sin. If you know the right thing and you're not doing it, right? It's hard for God to bless you. Say, God, you know what? I, I, I want to walk with you. I, I want to have a relationship with you. And God says, listen to me. James puts it this way. And do not be a doer, do not, let's see, excuse me, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will I bless in what he does. Did you catch that? God doesn't want you to just hear it. You know, often sometimes I feel bad for you because I'm up here and you're down there and you're stuck listening to me. You know? But you guys are hearing the word. Hopefully that's what you're hearing. Right? Not my opinions, not my views. Hopefully you're getting, and God's speaking to you through this. The question is, are you doing it? Are you putting the very things that you know that God wants you to do into action? And God says, in this, I will bless you in what you do. In the midst of the storm, be faithful. And be faithful to what God has asked you to do. Put what you know into action. In the midst of it all, in the bitterness, in the hurt, and in the pain, say, God, I'm going to keep my eyes on you, and I'm going to be faithful through it all. God will bless you. God will bless you. Finally, at the end of all this, Exodus tells us that we have— uh, the joy starts flowing over. 
Exodus continues on, guys, run them down to the waters. Uh, they complain. Uh, Moses throws a stick in there. It becomes now as clear water. And they're there for a little while. Then they move on. He says, For I am the Lord who heals you. And I love this in the Hebrew. It's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. The Lord wants to heal us, not just physically, but emotionally and spiritually in all the hurts and pains that are around us. And I dare say most of us probably bear in our, our souls scars from this world. Hurts and pains. And God heals those things. He can heal the bitterness in the midst of these things, despite our circumstances. And in here, give us joy. Because here they pack up. He says, then they came to Elam. And there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees. And so they encamped there by the waters. Listen, the struggle we're going through will not last forever. There are things that will come to an end. Look, there's times of bitterness. Right? It, look at the pattern here. There was rejoicing. They crossed the Red Sea. God was victorious in their life. They were praising God. And then they hit the hard times. But guess what? Those things are temporary too. And God brought them back. And they came to this place where there's 12 wells of water. There's all these palm trees. Now I just picture this oasis in the middle of the desert. And God can provide those for us. But sometimes we have to go through the hard times to get to those again. Sometimes there's a lesson for us to learn. And you know what? I'm, I'm stubborn. Right, honey? I'm stubborn. Yeah, she's like... Yeah. I don't, I'm not always the quickest learner. And sometimes that's the way it is with God. Let me ask you, have you, have you ever gone through... You feel like you're on that treadmill? Here's the same circumstance again. Here's the same test again. I didn't do so well the first time. And God doesn't really grade on a curve. You know, in my life, God's trying to teach me a lesson. He's trying to teach me to rely on him. And I go through a hard time, and, and I just fall apart, and I crumble. And, and, and I'm like, okay, God, now I've just moved on. And God says, okay, well, you got a D plus on it this time. And now we're going to move on. No, God does. You know what? We're going to go through this again until you learn. And sometimes in my life, it takes me three, four, five, six, seven, eight times and maybe there's some areas in my life where I still don't get it yet. And before you get all judgy, I think some of you are the same way. And it might be different areas and different temptations, right? But God's working on us. And sometimes we go through it again and again and again and in here. But when we get through the other side, there's times of refreshment. There's times of blessings. There's times of these things in the midst of it all. And that's what he did here. Philippians tells us, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God will surpass all understanding and will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's times where we're refreshing and blessing through it all as we pour out our requests unto him. God, help me. Lord, in the flesh, I am about ready to give up. I'm pulling out my hair. I'm just about ready to go, ah! Right? You ever done that? Well, I, I remember one lady, she, you know, I was talking to her, and, and things were going on, and she goes, Pastor, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown, and I deserve it. I've worked hard for it. It's been coming on. It's going to happen. I deserve it. Well, what do you say to that? <laughs> you know? Be anxious in nothing. And sometimes in the midst of those things, for as the bitterness comes in and the anger comes in, and the situations come in, Lord, calm my soul. Lord, I'm going to pour this on to you. And you guard my heart and you guard my mind. And God, you will bless. And I believe with all my heart that he will. Because, folks, at the end of the day, you know, Israel, you're going through the wilderness. God told them, I'm going to bring you to the promised land. Right? There's a land flowing with milk and honey. There's some good things down there. You just got to get there. 
And we're kind of like this. I know I have a heaven for place. And I know there's a place for me prepared. Right? Heaven's going to be wonderful. No more sickness, no more death, no more tears. Heaven looks wonderful. I'm just not there yet. And I know I have that. But in here, along the way, the struggle, the difficulty, all makes it worth it. When we go out to see my family, we drive. And it's about 1,200 miles. Right? And I'm getting older, and traveling isn't so fun anymore. And I, I, I. But I can say, you know what? When we get there, it'll be worth it. I mean, you probably more so on the way home, because on the way out, you're kind of excited you're getting out there. Then you're in there, and we're out, out there probably about, I don't know, probably about five days. And then we head home, and after you're in the car for 1,200 miles, you get back into the car again, and your rear end remembers and picks up right where you left off. It, you know, your body's like, oh, I remember this. <sighs> and coming home is always so much harder. And then finally, to get the last stretch, and there's been a few times we're driving up through, it's like, oh, should we just pull over? And you know, if you pull over, it makes it one more day. <sighs> and it's like, won't it be so good to get into your own bed? And usually the last probably six, seven hours of that trip, I'm like, my pillow is like, I missed you. Right? And I'm like, I can't wait to get home. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm sick of driving. I don't want one more burger, one more fast food. I'm just, right? And we get home, drop, stop. Do not pass go. Do not click 200. Don't even take a shower. Sorry, but to go up and then lay down on the bed. Oh, I missed you. <laughs> right? Ah, oh, it feels, right? But what gets you there is what you know what's waiting for you. First Corinthians puts it this way. But as it is written, eye is not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Folks, the struggles we're going through now are nothing compared to the blessings that's ahead of us. And what we're going through is this up and down. We're going to see this throughout Israel. That they're going well and down and up and down and up and down. And as they go through this, folks, to be steady is to keep your eyes on what's in store. And the Bible says, you know what? I don't care what, you know, have you ever read a book about heaven? It doesn't do it justice. The Bible says here, you know what? You, you can't even imagine. And I have a big imagination. Right? You can't even imagine what heaven's going to be like. That's how much it's going to be. It's, you know, think about it, and it's even better than that. Keep our eyes on the Lord. You'll see us through the bitterness. You'll see us through the anger. You'll see us through all these things as we keep our eyes on Him. These are lessons we need to learn along the way. Through this life, through the desert of this life, God will see us through. Keep our eyes on him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, we are going to come through bitter times in our lives. We're going to be hurt or we will struggle, but you are faithful. Lord, see us through the storm. Strengthen us, we ask. I believe right now there's some people who are going through some hard times. Lord, help them to hold your hand and to follow you. Because a better day is coming on the other side. Lord, we ask these things in your name. Amen.